Okay, hello YouTube. Um, today what we're going to be doing is we're going to be taking a look at a very famous chess player. We're going to be taking a look at Mikhail Tao. Now, the reason I'm making this video is because I saw a thread um, the other day and it really bothered me. It was, if Mikhail Tao played chess today, modern computers would destroy his ideas. And this really bothered me because this is something that somebody would say that clearly hasn't taken a look at Mikhail Tao's games, but also clearly doesn't understand how modern engines are evaluating positions. I think they're off kind of on both fronts. Um, and I hope that this video will just kind of explain why. So if you like content like this and you want to see more of it, please go ahead and hit that subscribe button and please click on your notification icon. So this argument is that the speculative nature that the creative style of Mikhail Tao, if ran through a modern engine, engines would pick apart all the little inaccuracies of his creativeness because computers crush all things that are creative and that Mikhail Tao's style would be left wanting and that he would lose against um, everyone and everything, you know, with modern engines. And this is ridiculous because if you start looking at the way Mikhail Tao played, and you compare it to modern engines, if anything, he played really, really close to what a lot of modern engines are saying, especially if you use some of the more modern engines, and that's what I'm going to do right now. So I, for this, I'm going to be using um, Stockfish 14.1, and um, some, somebody recently turned me on to this. Um, uh, it, they recently turned me on to this engine. It's actually a hybrid engine. It's running both an AI platform and an algorithmic platform. Now, saying that Tao's stuff was sound according to modern engines, I think might have been true like in the 90s or something, back when everybody was just running algorithmic engines, and the algorithmic engines were pretty weak, and they were very materialistic. Um, these days, modern engines are really good at assessing um, sacrifices, especially sacrifices that have a relatively concrete nature. So sacrifices that, you know, guys like Mikhail Tal and guys like Gary Kasparov and even occasionally Bobby Fischer, sacrifices that guys like that played on a regular basis. Um, you know, a lot of what Tal did was extraordinarily concrete. So Here's a great example of his game against uh, Robert J. Fisher, played back in 1959. And to, to, to take a fair look at Mikhail, Mikhail Tao, I mean, the argument is that, you know, you take Mikhail Tao in his prime. So I took all of these games. We're taking a look at five games from Mikhail Tao's prime, from 1959 to about 1963. Okay, and we're going to compare and see what the engine says about his play. So this is uh, Tao versus Fisher in the Candidates Tournament in 1959. And uh, it was one of Fisher's favorite openings. It was a King's Indian. As you can see, the engine already kind of doesn't like the King's Indian. So we have uh, Tao gaining some space and getting an advantage according to the computer. And uh, it, it didn't like his Bishop H4, which is you know still considered relatively modern theory. So let's not worry too much about that. And then we have a6, we have castles, we have queen e8, and then we have uh, knight d2, which happens to be the computer's top pick. And I just want you to look at the engine assessment while the game is getting played, and just notice how often Tao's moves will align with that computer's top pick. So we have knight h7 from Fisher, b4 from Tao, totally aligning again with the computer's top pick. We have bishop f6, and, you know, the longer I let the computer run, the, the more it'll come up with different ideas, but it's pretty much saying that exchanging bishops is the best idea, so that's what Tal did. You wonder, after looking at some of these games under, under an engine, you start wondering if Tal had an engine. I mean, seriously, like, I think Tal, if you, if you take Tal and you put him in modern-day chess, we'd wonder if he was cheating. I mean, that's how close he plays to an engine most of the time. Look at this, computer's top pick again with decisive advantage for white. Stockfish 14.1 is just, just hammering this home. Uh, knight b3, you know, it's, it's a normal move. I mean, just knight b3 improving our position. Tal's chess looked really smooth. You know, he was a very smooth positional player. He understood positional chess. Queen e7, queen d2, gaining that tempo against h6, forcing king h7. Now here's a move that he plays that doesn't jive with the computer. He plays queen e3. 
but the computer also doesn't hate it. <laughs> the computer is saying this is still Major Advantage White, so would, it, would an engine trounce him? I don't know. He's still doing really well. So knight to g8, and then we have c5. Again, not letting the advantage slip in any way. f5, and then he reverts back to computer top moves. ef5, gf5, f4, computer top moves. ef4, we have queen f4, again, the computer top move. Takes, and then what's interesting here is the move that Mikhail Tau is kind of known for in this game is this sacrifice that he plays on the very next move. And the computer doesn't like it. But it doesn't like it for the reason that most of you are thinking it doesn't like it, which is, yeah, the computer doesn't like sacking material. It didn't like it because it allowed Black to decline the sacrifice and run away. And that's why the computer wanted Tau to just immediately pounce and play Bishop takes f5. It didn't like Tau's move of rook e6. It felt it was inaccurate, not because it allowed the move that Fisher played, which ultimately lost, because it allowed Black to retreat and gave him a chance to try to hold on. The computer wanted Fisher to play queen g7 and not take any of the material, and it felt like that position might be uh, close to holding for Black. But Fisher did take the material. He took the stuff, and of course, after Fisher takes the stuff, how much more concrete can you get? The computer's saying this is plus five or plus six. So Tau sacrifices a knight. This was a Tau sacrifice, right? He sacrificed a knight, but he's basically mating people. So bishop takes f5, queen takes f5, rook f3, rook e8. Some stuff gets exchanged, and yeah, all of black's pieces are trapped. This is over. Fisher could probably just resign right here. This is so over. He just runs him out of moves. And now Fisher does resign. He's like minus nine. He, everything hangs. All the pieces fall. It's over. Okay, so that's the first game. So let's take a look at another game. And the other game is, uh, the next game is going to be another Fisher game. So we saw how Tal attacked. Let's see how Tal defends. Let's see how close he gets to the computer when he defends. Because Tal didn't just sacrifice material. You have to look at all of Tal's games. Tal also occasionally would be on the defending side of a position. Fisher actually played this whole game in what we could call Tal style. Uh, he went ahead and he sacrificed his pawn on e4, which Tal took. He took it like like um, just a, a very greedy person. He just wanted this pawn and he just took it. Tal did do this on occasion. He was known for this. He could, he could grab a pawn, keep it, and try to hang on to it. He could defend. So like the comment that was made in the, in the, um, in the bulletin was that uh, Fisher played the entire game as Tal in Tal style, but unfortunately Tal did not defend in Fisher style. That was the comment that the uh, that the Russian bulletin made because, of course, they were trying to build up Mikhail Tal at the time. Um, but um, it's not totally inaccurate. You know, Fisher played a very aggressive attacking game, and if this could be considered um, Tal style, I want to note that the computer really liked um, White's attack um, in this game. So, like after Castles and then after G6, which uh, both the computer and a lot of annotators considered a mistake, um, but they didn't have a lot of great improvements, so we're not going to fault g6. Um, Fisher played f5, and then after gf5, we have knight f5, and the machines are loving white's position. You know, this knight just hanging on f5, white being down a whole horde of pawns, but they're just loving all of the attacking chances going on here, and black's very limited development. Modern engines are loving this. They're saying major advantage white here. So Tal plays one of the top two picks here. He plays the move rook g8 to activate his pieces and just start trying to generate some type of active defense. And then Fisher proceeds with the computer's top pick, continuing this super aggressive, I guess we could call it Tau-like sacrificing idea of bishop d5. This looks very similar to a lot of Tau games. Another thing that you'll notice is if you run a lot of Tau games through an engine, they'll have the same concrete assessment where they're just assessing the position as just better for white. This is these are actually really concrete sacrifices. If you take either one of these pieces, you're going to be dead lost. So we have rook a7 uh, got played, which again was the only move. And it was the computer's top pick to try to survive. We have rook a7. And then we have um, Fisher continue with bishop takes e4, taking the material, which this annotator gave a question mark, which is wrong. It was, it was acceptable. The computer liked it. So e takes f5. And then we have bishop takes f5, which is ostensibly correct. And then we have rook e7, which is the only move. We have bishop c8, 
queen c8, we have bishop f4, which is a mistake. And it allows Tau to get back into a game, again, with the computer number one top pick, numero uno pick, queen c6. So he's defending like an engine. I mean, this is why Tau was impossible to play. You know, he defended like an engine. So he's threatening mate, he's threatening the knight, he's winning material, um, but he's doing it with his king in the center the whole time. You know, queen f3, he, he snaps the knight with his king in the middle, with his position nearly falling apart. He snaps the material like a machine, and he just keeps it, just brings his queen back, everything's fine. This guy was a calculating beast, so to say that his game wouldn't hold up against modern engines with the accuracy level that this man calculated with, I mean, it's an insult to this guy. He was a world champion. You know, this wasn't just some random guy sacrificing pieces. This was a guy playing the best players in the world and dominating. Okay, especially from about 1959 to about 1961, this guy was invincible. Okay, so we have bishop takes. We have queen b6 check. Again, finding only defensive moves every move. And then we have this mistake by Fisher, queen c6. So funny story behind this mistake. Fisher actually wrote down the move rook to ae1, and he writes about this in his book, uh, The Life and Games of Mikhail Tal. Uh, Mikhail Tal does. And he actually showed it to Tal, almost asking for like approval with rook ae1, and Tal knew that it was the best move. And if you look at the assessment here, it gives it as the only move that equalizes for white. All of their moves seem to lead to advantage black, with black holding on to the material and going on to win from there. Tal says... He didn't know what to do. He didn't want to give anything away, so he did the natural thing. He just got up and started walking around. And Fisher um, rethought his move and then ended up playing something different. He ended up playing queen c6. And after the game, Tal asked him why, and Fisher said, oh, because when I wrote down rook e1, you laughed at me. So Fisher knew how good Tal was. He was searching for approval, you know. And um, when he didn't get it, he thought maybe there must be something wrong with queen c6. Fisher was very young when he played this game. And um, queen c6 is the incorrect move, and it allows Tau to weasel out again with all these perfectly accurate, um, just top flight chess moves. Every single, you know, move, just pinpoint accuracy and just getting the material off the board, getting his king to safety, and, you know, weaseling his way into a position that's plus three, plus four uh, for black, and then going on to play perfectly from there. So again, lining up with, with Stockfish 14.1. So let's take a look at another game, because we want to take a look at different games under different conditions where he does different things. So here's a game where Tal's playing the white pieces, and he just plays the game in a totally positional style. He does a, a delayed exchange variation. He just defends his pawn, and then he just plays totally positionally. He's got a very slight advantage in terms of pawn structure. Um, this game was played in Prague in 1960. And I just want you to see something here. His opponent in a second is just going to make a very minor positional error. He's going to play g5. Um, and any time his opponent made errors like this, Tau would pounce immediately. And he just lines up with the computer so perfectly, he would play queen f5. So just immediately taking advantage of this error of leaving the pawn on g5 and not being able to defend it in the proper way. And then after we have pawn to h5, again, Tau picking what was at least momentarily the computer's top pick, d4, but definitely one of the top two. Striking in the middle of the board, taking advantage of these very, you know, taking advantage of these tactical errors, and now he grabs a pawn and he keeps it. So Tau wasn't just a guy that sacrificed material. He also took advantage of positional errors. He also took advantage of tactical errors. He also grabbed material on a regular basis. This isn't the only time we've seen Tal do this. He just did it against Fisher. He did it against a bunch of other opponents, too. He did this on a regular basis, where he would grab material, keep it, and then he would continue to play perfect positional chess. And not only perfect positional chess, perfectly accurate chess, according to the machine, just hammering home these huge, um, you know, advantages according to the engines, simplifying this position into an endgame that's just easily winnable, and then he would go on to win. So let's take a look at another example. So we have Tau versus Botvinnik. So a, a lot of people that are making this comment that Tau would get torn apart is because Tau introduced a lot of crazy, weird, and new ideas in the game of chess. So this was one of Tau's crazy, weird, and new ideas that he introduced. He introduced recapturing with the G pawn, right? So 
a modern engine would tear this apart. Then why does the modern engine think that White's doing okay? It doesn't think that he's done anything so crazy that the position has been destroyed for White in any way. It thinks the position is still roughly level. And after e6, it picks his move as the top pick. And then after knight to d7, it thinks that White has a slight edge. So how is it tearing apart Tal's crazy G captures F3 idea when he has a slight edge here? Okay, now this game ended up going on to be a draw, and there was a few more mistakes in it, but none of it was, you know, ludicrous. So anyways, let's go on to the next game, because I know that the one thing that everybody wants to talk about is we're not talking about any of that stuff. We're talking about when Mikhail Tal made his Tal sacrifices, when he sacrificed these pieces for positional compensation that was long term, right? Well, for starters, the majority of the games that he did that were in the open Sicilian. And I want to be clear, all modern players sacrifice material in the open Sicilian. And the reason we sacrifice material in the open Sicilian is because of just the way the open Sicilian works. So what Mikhail Tau was a big fan of was he was a big fan of this bishop g5 variation against the Nidorf. And then after he developed in like a really, number one, really straightforward way, um, he, he developed kind of these systems in a lot of ways, just playing f4, queen f3, and then castling queen side and just being super, super solid in the way he developed. Knight on b to d7, and then g4. Now, this was what Tal did. He helped develop these g4 and g5 systems. He didn't do some of the um, weirder, uh, crazier stuff that other people came up with where they ended up sacrificing in the middle of the board for far less. Like, there's a line right here. The modern main line is actually a lot dartier and a lot crazier than what Tau played. The modern main line is to play f5 and give up this pawn immediately. Tau just played something really sedate here. He just played a3. Just a really nice sedate move. And then this eventually, I guess, leads to what we could call a Tal sacrifice. After bishop b7, Tal plays bishop h3. And after castle's queenside, Tal plays bishop takes e6, which is confirmed by the computer to be the number one move. So, I mean, bishop takes e6, um, not only is it not unsound, I mean, it, it's, you know, it darts around a little bit, but it's always in the computer's top five. The computer's saying this is major advantage white if we sacrifice this material. And, okay, here it is, number two, and... Maybe if we let it run a little bit, it'll even say number one. It likes f5 a little bit better, the machine does. But now it's liking bishop e6 again. It's coming back up towards the top. But we certainly can't say that a modern engine is going to tear this sacrifice apart and refute it. It's recommending it. It's saying we should play bishop e6. This is a standard type of sacrifice in the open Sicilian. The reason is, is because what black is trying to do is restrict white's pieces with pawns by controlling all of these central moving squares. And the only way that white can get freedom for his pieces, which want to move forward but can't because there's pawns in the way, is at some point for these pawns to get moved out of the way. And we can do that by pushing pawns or we can do that by sacrificing material. Now computers are assessing their position based on how mobile your, your pieces are and how much space you have. But unfortunately, in the open Sicilian, black restricts both of those things for white by basically building these trenches with his pawns, and we can break through that by sacrificing material to give our pieces more space and better squares to sit on. And believe it or not, modern engines have no trouble understanding this at all. No trouble. And they absolutely are agreeing with this sacrifice, um, bishop takes e6. So we have bishop takes e6, which shouldn't be given any type of interesting. It's really just the best move. Um, or, or definitely in the top one or two of the best moves. We have queen c4, we have knight d5, and again, just notice how he's following this up every single time, just right on the money. King b7. Can we get somebody in here to check and see if Tal's cheating? I mean, seriously, look at this. b3. Is he cheating? Is he finding all these moves, like, without engine assistance? Like, I don't know. Is he going to the bathroom too much, using his cell phone? What's going on? You know, b3, queen c8, rook d3. How is he doing this? You know, this guy played chess before engines. How is he finding these moves? Rick b3, we have knight d6. Did he, did, he, did he find the killer blow immediately? Did he find the mistake with knight? Yes, he did. Of course he did. He's Tau. You know, the guy's a machine. Queen d7, rook c7 check, correct. And then we have queen c3 check, correct. And then we have 
queen g7. Of course he found it. Why wouldn't he find it? He didn't go for anything else. He didn't go for queen c6. He went for the computer's top pick. Just absolutely ruthless in executing his advantages and executing them with just extreme accuracy. Look at this. He can retreat his queen anywhere. He picked the computer top move. He can retreat it anywhere. He's still winning. He can play queen f7, queen h6, queen d4, queen c2, anything. He picks the computer's top move. Queen d4, bishop e7, and then we have rook e6, which is given an exclamation point. And it's pretty good. Other moves win too. So rook e6, we have rook f8, um, h4, and I mean, I could go on, but Tau goes on to win this game, again, just playing with relatively perfect computer accuracy. So I'll just blitz through the rest of the moves. This is really kind of the last game I wanted to look at. So, I mean, these so-called Tau sacrifices... I mean, he never lets it, his advantage slip here, and he eventually just goes on to to, to to win. He plays king c4, and black resigns because white's going to be making a new queen, and he's going to be getting mate, so this is pretty much over. So this myth that Mikhail Tao played crazy sacrificial chess all the time, he was always sacrificing material, and that if you take a look at his sacrifices in modern day engines, that engines would absolutely tear apart what uh, Mikhail Tao was doing and they would refute everything it is ridiculous. Mikhail Tao played solid chess, he played accurate chess. Most of the sacrifices that he played were extremely concrete and not only held up by modern engines, a lot of them are recommended by modern engines. So I think that this idea that Tau would get torn apart by modern engines. It's a misunderstanding of how Tau played chess, and it's a misunderstanding of how engines assess chess, especially modern engines. I think that we would see a lot of disagreement with how Tau played chess if we were looking at engines back in the 90s, you know, which were a lot weaker. But modern strong engines, they like players like Tau. They like players like Kasparov. They like these guys. They think that they came up with good stuff that was relatively solid. So um, that's my take on this idea that Tau would get destroyed by modern engines. I think he would hold up pretty good. And I think if he was playing today, I think a lot of people would accuse him of cheating and possibly accuse him of using an, an, of using an engine. <laughs> so anyways, um, I hope you liked that video. I hope you found it helpful. And I hope you learned something new about chess. And I hope you learned something new about one of our um, greatest world champions, um, uh, uh, Mikhail Tau. Um, thank you very much for watching.